Salone Radmond receives criticism for calling out groomers and perverts, and when you know, the people coming to their defense are also groomers and perverts. Plus, the Live to TikTok has been the latest victim of doxing. How did that happen? And lastly, I was finally able to see The Batman. Is it better than The Dark Knight? We'll figure that out. I'm Luke Kratzer, and this is The Luke Kratzer Show. So previously, I informed you of the perverted groomers within the education system all throughout the country. However, I didn't discuss the groomers that we have here in North Carolina. And considering this state ranks the highest in sexual indoctrination and sexual abuse, I feel obligated to share with you how crazy it is. Luckily, I'm not the only one shedding light on the topic. Sloan Radmuth, president of Education First Alliance, built a reputation for attacking this problem as well. For the past few years, she has been able to expose the corruptions of the education system in North Carolina, from CRT and masking children to the sexual indoctrination and exploitation of children. She has been able to expose groomers all over the state. However, recently Sloan has been going viral over a post on social media that has received some blowback. The post reads, quote, We have moles in most teachers' groups. We pay money to teachers who are willing to expose others who threaten children and parents, end quote. So Sloan and her organization are willing to pay teachers money for exposing and reporting sexual indoctrination or sexual abuse of any kind. Now, some of you probably think of this as a little excessive, but I would rather disagree. Because when we get to a point where a teacher can prescribe a child puberty blockers at any age without the parent's consent, or have teachers teaching you about how to have oral sets in, to middle schoolers, then it's about time parents start knowing what actually happens inside the classrooms. With that said, select individuals didn't like the fact that Sloan was exposing these creeps, so they decided to defend them with an array of comments saying Sloan and her organization should be banned and that they don't know what they're talking about. The funny thing is though, the individuals that are in defense of these perverts consist of, and I'm not joking here, strippers, boudoir photographers, convicted felons, and even orgy organizers which I'm still surprised is an actual thing. Since we started reporting on um, grooming in the classroom, we have had a weird coalition of strippers, boudoir photographers, um, convicted felons, uh, professional orgy organizers, um, let's see, sex workers, and union teachers who have formed a coalition, um, who have started uh, being extremely rude on our Facebook page, private messages and others. So, so we have people like this defending these sexual predators in NC schools, and we are supposed to take them seriously? I mean, yeah, I definitely trust a stripper or orgy organizer to have the highest or ethical moral positions when it comes to teaching me or anyone else. I mean, why would these individuals want children to think less of immoral professions that exploit people in the most personal ways? Like, you can tell it's a noble cause to defend when it's really the best society has to offer, like convicted felons or prostitutes. Just saying. So, speaking of calling people out, this week the now popular Twitter account, Libs at TikTok, has become the latest victim of doxing. For those of you who don't know what that means, doxing is the searching of and posting of private or personal information of an individual. So here's the whole story. A journalist by the name of Taylor Lorenzo found a tweet from the anonymous Twitter account known as the Libs at TikTok. And in response to the tweet, she decided to write an entire article based on the account. The article reads, quote, On March 8th, a Twitter account called Libs of TikTok posted a video of a woman teaching sex education to children in Kentucky, calling the woman in the video a predator. The next evening, the same clip was featured on Laura's Ingram's Fox News program, prompting the host to ask, when did our public schools, any schools, become what are essentially grooming centers for gender identity radicals?" End quote. Now, for those who don't know what video was being referenced here, I looked it up and it was actually the video of the woman who brads to little children about masturbation. Which, coincidentally, is the exact woman I talked about on my channel during an earlier episode. 
So you guys already know that what this journalist is about to say is completely biased from a woke perspective. As you continue through the article, you do see Ms. Lorenzo continue to trash all over the libs of TikTok. And not only does she do that, she decides to do something a lot worse. This is where the dot team comes to play. Before she wrote the article, Miss Lorenzo decided to do a deep dive on the account and was not only able to find the account owner's real name, but even her work history, social media history, and even an old home address. Now, some of that information was edited out of the article later on, but there is still enough information for psychos to go after the owner of Lives at Tittot if they really wanted to. In fact, the, the Daily Wire has two articles following the story. One article contains a story of a woman who is receiving disturbing messages on social media believing that she was behind the Live the TikTok account for they both shared the same name. In response, the woman wrote to the journalist, <clears throat> quote, Taylor Lorenzo, this is on you. You need to clarify this is not me. People are posting and tweeting my parents' home address. If anything happens to my family, it is on you. So if this is the treatment for people who just share the same name as Lip the TikTok, you can imagine what is currently happening to the real account holder. We got word that the real woman behind Lib to TikTok is now receiving death threats online. One in particular is a tweet of a gun with the caption, Assassination mode activated. Action word, Libs of TikTok. So there are people who are sending actual death threats to the Libs of TikTok. And for those who are asking why she didn't report it to Twitter, surprise, surprise, she did, but the Twitter guidelines were able to deem it appropriate for the platform. Yeah, that completely made sense. And if you think that's all, it still gets worse from here. For this segment, I did some research on Miss Lorenzo, and I was able to find an interview of her where she was a victim of the exact situation she put Liv to TikTok in. Here's the video. I've had to remove every single social tie. I had severe PTSD from this. I, I contemplated suicide. It got really bad. You feel like any little piece of information that gets out on you will be used by the worst people on the internet to destroy your life. And it's so isolating. And terrifying. It's horrifying. I'm so sorry. It's, fine. it's so overwhelming. Ready. So she has been through everything referencing this situation. Knows the pain of going through it all. And yet she decided to dot to live the TikTok anyway. I mean, what a terrible human being she is. I mean, this is just messed up. Now, with all that in mind, I think the real question we should want an answer to is why the media is so interested in Lives at TikTok. I mean, all the channel ever did was just repost other TikTok videos. The channel isn't making up its own content to show what's actually happening. So, I think the answer is pretty simple, really. The Lives at TikTok decided to share the woke content found on TikTok. Content that little kids are being exposed to every day, by the way. And the woke community was tired. They were tired of their concept of reality being shared on another channel with an audience that doesn't appreciate what they're doing. So some of you are probably wondering why it took me so long to do a review of The Batman. And the reason why will be because I wasn't able to see it in theaters. I know, shocking. But in my defense, I was super busy. With that said, now that the movie is out on HBO, I can give a full review of the film. Now, this review will contain spoilers, but let's face it, everybody's probably seen it at this point. Let's start with the good parts of the film. To me, there were a lot of things. Uh, first, it would have to be the cinematography. Almost every scene in this film was cinematically stunning, from the dark lighting to the visual effects, and I mean, it was all just super cool to me. Uh, the second element would have to be the musical score. Out of all the Batman themes, this is probably my favorite one, because it's very different from the past themes. Uh, compared to The Dark Knight, the theme for the Batman feels more energetic and more suspenseful, while the Dark Knight theme is more heroic and action-packed. It's still good, it's just something I noticed. All that said, my favorite parts about the movie are definitely the fight scenes. If there was one thing that the movie got right, it was how violent Batman is. In every fight scene, there was no mercy for anyone. There weren't a lot of fight scenes in this film, but when they showed up, they were the most satisfying parts of this film to watch. 
Okay, now that I listed all the things I liked about this film, it's time for the dislikes. To be honest, the problems I had with this movie didn't really appear until the end of the film. In the beginning, I was really into it. The metal was okay, but the ending was kind of meh. Like at the end of the, at the end where the Riddler just surrenders to the police and just gets taken to Arkham, and no one and not even Batman bothers asking why he gave up so easily. I mean, I would have asked that immediately. And then there was the final part of the Riddler's plan, like the Great Flood in Gotham City. Like, what was he hoping to accomplish with that plan? Like, what was his motivation for that plan? In the beginning, his plan made sense. Like, he was trying to expose Gotham's corruption and lies. I mean, that made sense. But then he flipped the script and just went, Ooh, let's flood the city. That sounds fun. I mean, I just don't get that. Another problem I had with the film would have to be how they portray Batman and Bruce Wayne. And some of you guys already know where I'm going with this, but... Like, there is no difference between Bruce Wayne and Batman in this film. Half the reason why Batman's secret identity is the eccentric billionaire Bruce Wayne is because no one would ever think someone as charismatic as Bruce Wayne would be the rageful freak of nature in a Batman suit. With the way Bruce Wayne acts in this film, I'm surprised no one was able to even suspect he was Batman. Just saying. And my final issue with this film would have to be the motivation behind Batman's character. Like, in the Batman Begins film, his motivations were pretty clear. After the death of his parents and realizing how corrupt Gotham really is, he decided to become Batman as a way to not only strike fear into his enemies, but also be a symbol of hope for the people of Gotham. In this Batman movie, I don't completely understand what his true motivations are. Like, this Batman feels more like an edgy teen, an edgy 20-year-old fighting bad guys because he's an edgy 20-year-old. That's what it felt like. And you never really know what was the thing that drove him to be the Batman. Now, I'm not saying they had to do another Kill Bruce's Parents scene again, because God only knows how many of those have been out there, but I think they could have done a little better with the motivations behind the character. So, in conclusion, The Batman is not my favorite Batman film. It has a few entertaining elements here and there, but to prove otherwise, the greatest Batman film will forever be The Dark Knight. Alright guys, I know there wasn't a cringe vid last week, so I am doing a cringe vid this week. So let's see what we got. Okay, so we got Joe Biden. Where is he? Wait, this is the... What, the Easter... <laughs> Why does he look so scared of it? And, and the bunny's back. The bunny's... Just, he's making him leave. What is with that face? I mean, He's probably saying, do you see the bunny too? Like, I feel like I'm going crazy here. Alright, I think we could end it from here. Oh, uh, that is hilarious. Okay, so on a level of cringe, I would have to say 3 out of 10. Mainly because it's still our US president looking like he is scared of the Easter Bunny. Other than that, the rest of the clip is still pretty funny, so that's how I would rate it. Well guys, that's our show for today. If you like my content, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Be sure to click the little bell icon, that way you won't miss any of my new content. Anyway, I wish you all a happy weekend, and I'll see you all next Friday. I'm Luke Kratzer, and thank you for joining me on The Luke Kratzer Show. Peace out, guys.